Welcome to the JSW Radio Hour podcast, produced by the University of Arizona Southwest Center in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. I'm Jeff Bannister. The following audio essay, part of our JSW Radio Archive series, is taken from the introduction to the book Entre Lloris y Guarijillos, Crónicas sobre el Quehacer Antropológico, written by Mexican anthropologist Dr. Teresa Valdivia Donce, a researcher at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. A translation of Valdivia's book appeared in the autumn 2014 issue of Journal of the Southwest with the title Between Yoris and Guarijillos, Chronicles of Anthropology. Valdivia, who grew up in Mexico City, traveled to southern Sonora for the first time in the late 1970s as part of a team of social workers, medical professionals, and researchers sent by the Mexican government to aid the Guarijillo indigenous people in their struggle with extreme poverty and isolation. Over the course of decades, their homeland in the skirts of the Sierra Madre of Sonora and Chihuahua had been encroached upon and appropriated by non-indigenous ranchers, whom the Guarijillos and other indigenous peoples of southern Sonora refer to as Yoris. Pushed onto some of the region's most marginal lands, the Guarijillos had few options but to sell their labor for a pittance to those same Yori ranchers and, on a seasonal basis, to farmers in the prosperous agricultural districts of the Sonoran coastal plain. Dr. Valdivia's book includes a personal account of the many years she spent working with the Guarijillos in their epic struggle to recover their lands. It also includes a thoughtful reflection on the intersection of anthropology and literature in Mexico, written by Valdivia's friend and mentor, Professor Andres Medina Hernandez, and an account of the Guarijillo struggle, co-written with her longtime friend and Guarijillo leader, Cipriano Butimea. This edition of the JSW Radio Archive will include more excerpts from Dr. Valdivia's original Spanish-language publication in both English and Spanish. And we hope you enjoy this first installment. Between Yoris and Guarijillos, Chronicles of Anthropology. Introducing Between Yoris and Guarijillos by Maria Teresa Valdivia Donce, translated and edited by Jeffrey M. Bannister. I have been connected with the Guarijillos since the summer of 1978, when I was commissioned by the Instituto Nacional Indigenista, the National Indigenous Institute, or INI, to introduce federal government programs into the region. At that time, the Guarijillos had nothing, and delivering the services that they were requesting was not an easy task because they did not even have access to land where we could set up our installations. It might seem an exaggeration to say that they lacked everything, but there are times when reality simply outstrips imagination. They had no land or homes of their own, they did not have access to potable water or medical care, and there were no roads or electricity. Nothing. Just their poverty. Some still wore loincloths and shawls and lived in caves. They worked as peones acasillados for the large ranchos owned by the Yoris. And although for the average anthropologist, such circumstances would in no way be surprising, and even less a reason for making snap judgments, for me they definitely were, from the very first General Assembly of the Guadajillos that I attended, where I was to learn about the different problems facing them. My reasons for surprise came in the form of the fetid odor of hunger that emanated from that collection of empty stomachs, and which, that same year, led to the starvation and death of two adults. And so it is with no exaggeration to say that in the summer of 1978, the Guarijillos had nothing. Referring to that time, Cipriano Buitimea said, quote, We had problems that were so great we could not see the edge. I started my work as an indigenista with one idea in mind, to help the Guarijillos get their land. But at the first opportunity, I spread the word about the state that they were in because I believed that one of the causes of their situation was the isolation in which they lived, both the Guarijillos and the Yoris. Getting into the agrarian reform process pushed me to write a short historical synthesis in order to establish their rights to the land on which they were working as peones acasillados. The document formed part of the petition we filed for the case. Needless to say, the Ministry of Agrarian Reform, SRA, did not use it in its decision even though it was required. Ultimately, the land was returned to the Guarijillos as part of a politically driven decision. Absurd as it seems, because according to the SRA, Indians, Mexico's aboriginal population, had to demonstrate that their rights were based on use of said land for a legally mandated amount of time. Nevertheless, the historical research did help me in developing a brief ethnographic essay which the INI had requested. 
When I thought that we were coming close to getting the lands, Jose Sasueta and I designed a plan based on three types of land use, production, basic services, and homes. Yet, as land conflicts are at one and the same time juridical, economic, and political matters, they often turn into violent disputes that only the strongest win. The latter was not the case for me, and because of it, I had to quit my post at the INI two years following the granting of the Ejida lands to the Guadajillos, but not without denouncing once again their desperate and critical circumstances. In 1981, I returned to the region as a visitor, and I could see that our land use plan had become a tangible reality. And it is perhaps for this reason that I drifted away from my Guadajillo friends in the following years, conducting research within different institutions. Before doing that, however, I made sure that the work we did in Sonora could be written in a way that made sense. In this case, it was my undergraduate thesis. A short time later, I returned to work for the INI, though without having set foot in Guadajillo country for some time. The head of the Institute's Publications Division had asked me to write an article on the Tuburada for their bulletin. I was working on the piece when I received news, quite slow to arrive and not at all good, that José Sasueta had died a year earlier and the tribe was giving him his tuburada for the wake. This then was the reason for my return visit to Mesa Colorada in 1989. I had lost a very dear friend. The least I could do was attend his wake, to visit his grave and write a farewell letter. Regrettably, with the death of José Sasueta, a good deal of the tribe's history was also lost. Nothing could be done. This is what I was thinking about in Mesa Colorado when I was eating tortillas taken from a brimming basket. The life of Jose was not in vain. Thanks to his courage and abilities as a leader, the Guadajillos were able to close ranks in their struggle for land. Now they had it, as well as homes of their own, and they also had a small herd of cattle that they managed collectively, along with a school, a health clinic, and a cultural resource center. They even had a road from which you could at least drive to the first of their villages, and tortillas in abundance. It seems that as I was visiting Jose's grave, I picked up some of his courage because the following year I found myself writing about the part of the land struggle history to which I had been witness and which, I thought, had ended my debts with the Guadajillos and closed that chapter of my anthropological work and life history. And that is what gave birth to my book, Sierra de Nadie, which I set out to write as a frank description of anthropological work carried out in the indigenista tradition. The book would also be written in first person, focusing on what I did and did not do, and why and how it was that things turned out as they did, and all with absolute honesty, as if this were indispensable for understanding the variety of doubts that can assault the mind of a field anthropologist. Sierra de Nadie pushed me to organize my reflections along the lines of the different ways that field anthropologists relate to the actors and interpret and transcribe the different cultures that they are researching. I then sketched some of these ideas in a presentation that I gave for the 17th Simposio de Historia e Antropología de Sonora in 1992. Even though I have been interested in field methods since I was an undergraduate studying anthropology at the Universidad Veracruzana in Jalapa, Veracruz, these interests might not have surfaced in Sierra de Nadie if my professor, Andrés Medina Hernández, had not suggested that I include them in the book. I confess that at the time I wrote the book, in 1990, I thought the idea of covering field methods was rather nonsensical. But with time, I was able to revisit Medina's suggestion and recognize that this type of work is also anthropological and, therefore, should be analyzed, discussed, and reflected upon by professionals and used for its rich insights. In this kind of material, we find different responses to anthropological methods, to its techniques, and to a particular style of doing anthropology in Mexico. Returning to those early years, then, I remember that following the funeral and visit to my friend José Sasueta's grave, I had to make constant trips to Guadajillo country for a variety of reasons. In 1990, I was sent by the INI to carry out a study of the land struggle, which I finished that same year. Then, as I was carrying out the research... Cipriano Buitimea, one of the principal actors in the Guadajillo land struggle, requested that we write a book together that would tell the story of, quote, how we Guadajillos from here, from the Sierra, suffered as we struggled to get our lands, of everything that has happened and how we did it. He was worried by the inevitable condition of human morality, and he did not want to go the way Jose did, without leaving a legacy for the following generations. And, overall, because he saw that the young people did not value that which their elders had achieved with such great effort land for everyone. This worry, then, gave birth to the book Como Una Huella Pintada, coming from the same stance as Sierra de Nadie, 
Cipriano Witimea's oral history for which the two of us, witness and interpreter, became co-authors. With the production of Como Una Huella Pintada, combined with Sierra de Nadie, we have two complementary points of view of the people involved in the research, actor and investigator. Now, the only thing missing was to get the word out among the Guadijillos about this history turned into a book. But how are we to present it to a population that was around 90% illiterate? I returned to the idea of oral tradition, but with a new technology, creating two audio versions of the story in the Guadijillos' native tongue, one version for the Institute's radio station and another to be listened to on a low-tech cassette player. We gave these to each head of household. Then I was asked to write about the experience of working together with Cipriano, which became a paper I presented in Sonora. So it went that each time I thought I had finished the chapter of my life with the Guarajillos, for one reason or another, it would open once again. On one hand, reasons for returning to the Guarajillo zone continued to emerge. After the oral history won an award, Cipriano's wife had us support a tuburada for three years, from 1992 to 1994. I also made other trips for, quote, operations work, as they said in the INI. On the other hand, I was asked to write four additional articles on the Guarajillos and to participate over the course of four years running in the Simposio de Historia y Antropología de Sonora, organized by the Universidad de Sonora in Hermosillo. In the following years, I also worked hard to listen. That's how I learned that the Guarajillos felt mostly satisfied with what they now had in their possession, but they also complained that they still worked and worked, but often did not have the means to provide for their basic needs, not even for food. What could they do? What was going wrong? How could they truly become self-sufficient, or at the very least develop a more solid subsistence base? To answer these questions, I put together a brief diagnostic study, the results of which showed that the tribe had lost political force, and it was at a kind of impasse created by its current life conditions. It was especially paralyzed by the problem of not knowing how to organize for work in the absence of a yori patron. But if the study was useful for creating a few options, such as reinforcing the authority of Guadalajara representatives, the need to do it quickly meant leaving out important details, such as how current social and political dynamics related to control over environmental resources. And so it was that in 1992, when the government reformed Article 27 of the 1917 Constitution and approved a new agrarian law, I could not completely respond to the Guadalajara's concern over whether they should become comuneros. Little by little, I was coming to the realization that what was needed was a more expansive research project, that could respond to these matters of vital importance, which I tried to do in my master's thesis, completed in 1995. Fortunately, around that time period, it was easier to carry out research projects in greater depth because several researchers, both from Sonora and abroad, were working in the region, which meant I had access to a variety of books, published essays, theses, and press releases. Before that time, any social scientist who wanted to work in the Guadalajara region had but a few historical accounts taken from texts by Andres Pérez de Rivas, Fernando Ocoranza, and Francisco Javier Alegre, as well as works by archaeologists like Beatriz Branif and César Quijada, and material from pioneers who had worked in the Guadalajara zone, such as Howard Scott Gentry, who was, and continues to be, one of the most important sources of information on the region. Three years later, I found myself once again working the Guadalajara material, even though my current research project focused on the Mijes of Oaxaca. This time, it was because copies of Sierra de Nadie had run out, yet students were still interested in reading the book. Another print run was needed. Once again, I decided to heed the expert advice of my professor, Andres Medina, who recommended combining into one book the different texts that I have developed on the Guarajillos that share a similar anthropological approach. And that is how these texts were combined to form the current publication, Entre Yoris y Guarajillos, Crónica sobre el que hacer antropológico. All of this together was a way to combine my work into a larger reflection on how one does, interprets, and describes fieldwork based on an intense and deeply committed experience in the Guarijillo region of Sonora. I should clarify that this work focuses on the Guarijillos of Sonora, who in many ways have connections with those who are referred to as the Guarijillos of Chihuahua. This is because we are talking here about two populations with common roots in history, although those of Chihuahua have received far more scholarly attention than those of Sonora. For his part, Andres Medina Hernández was enthusiastic about writing an introduction to this book, which quickly turned into the longer study that follows this introduction, called La Línea Difusa Etnografía y Literatura en la Antropología Mexicana, The Diffuse Line, Ethnography and Literature in Mexican Anthropology. 
It is an excellent essay that crosses the borders between ethnography, methods, and literature, and is in many ways unique in its discursive and informational richness. The reader of Among Yoris and Warahios will not find here an ethnographic study of the Warahio population, although by the end of the book he or she will be fully familiar with it. Rather, the book has a distinctive outlook, even if perhaps insufficiently documented, on the motives and perspectives that anthropologists and actors hold during the process of fieldwork. Finally and above all, I want to thank Andres Medina for having motivated me to work along this line of anthropology, for having read and commented on the first draft, and for taking on the task of writing the opening essay for this new work. I also thank Mauricio Lopez Valdez for his close attention to the minutia of editing Sierra de Nadie and Like a Painted Footprint, Como una huella pintada. He made important suggestions that improved both texts, thanks to his passion for discussing the problems of cultural interpretation and of editing indigenous oral history. We had daily sessions for almost a year when I was writing Cipriano's oral history. I thank Adriana Inchaustegui for her editorial assistance and useful comments on matters of style, and to my mother, Maria de Los Angeles de Unce Villanueva, who helped transcribe the taped interviews with Cipriano Buitimea. To my sister, Maria Luisa Donce, for her expert editorial suggestions and corrections of style, which I applied to the structure of this book. I also thank the anonymous reviewers whose suggestions improved the text. To Marta Gonzalez and Ada Ligia Torres for editing and production. I also thank the readers of Sierra de Nadie for having gladly given their opinions. I hope that reading Like a Painted Footprint is for them an equally pleasant experience. To Pepan, Mexico City, January 2004.